Hello and welcome to Release Date Rewind. My name is Mark J. Parker and I am a film lover, filmmaker, film celebrator. And normally this is an audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts on your favorite apps. But thanks to Portland Media Center, you are about to watch the video component of this show where I celebrate movie anniversaries with my friends. Each month, I usually talk about two different movies that I love with different friends. And we talk about the making of the movies, trivia, any fun memories associated with them. So I hope you enjoy because now it's time to rewind. I'm the leprechaun. I'm the leprechaun. I'm the leprechaun. Love it. That's Mike Myers as as from Wayne's World on SNL when he's doing the I'm the leprechaun with Garth. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, totally, yes. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Well, we've started. And as you can tell, hopefully you can remember his voice because he's been on this show a few times. Always in the winter, Uh, Jeff. You are like my you're like my winter uh, expert because you were on last December for Scream and for Hook the December before that. Now he's here in January for a guilty pleasure. Please welcome everybody. My friend, filmmaker, podcaster, does a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And we're going to chat for a second about it before we get into Leprechaun. Welcome back, Jeff Frummis. Jeff Thank you so much. I want to know about your latest movie. Tell everyone, tell everyone who's oh. listening. I'm so curious. I know it premiered your film Gouge Away. Um, which which you had, which you also had a hand in. A little one, yeah, a long a time ago. One, but a long time ago. But listen, you know, uh, Candy and I, I owe Candy a phone call. Boy, do I owe her a phone call. Um, <laughs> Candy is, uh, uh, Candy's in the movie and she is awesome in her, in her role, That's which is like went from like being kind of small to being, slightly bigger than what was intended. Um, yeah. huh. Gouge Away started off life as another script called Wash Away that ultimately, you know, I was trying to make something really, you know, uh, grotesque and crazy and psychologically, you know. It's good. Uh, it was a great script. It was, it was, yeah, it was. But, you know, ultimately, I'm really glad that I didn't finish mm-hmm. that script because, or that it didn't, that I'm, I'm kind of happy that things turned out the way they did because, they're just, it just would have required the actors to do a lot of, you know, very heavy things that, you know, maybe, I don't know, like you have to handle these things with such care. And, and, uh, there was just a lot of, there was a lot of like, uh, trauma based, uh, uh, stuff in there that, you know, was, you know, it serviced the story, but it was also just, it was really heavy. It was heavy handed. Mm -hmm. You read the script, you know, Oh yeah, I mean, that ending was, wow. I I remember uh, it was some ending. And, um, and, and, you know, the script is, Gouge Away ended up being very dark as well, but, like, it was uh, basically what Gouge Away is, is it's the sequel to a movie that never actually existed. Because it was the only way to finish the movie was to actually make a sequel to the movie using the footage that would have been in the first movie. And so that's kind of how I did it. And I basically was shooting and writing and editing all at the same time. And it was very confusing. And I'm, I'm not even sure if it mm. makes sense. I think it makes sense. Did I send you the screener? I don't know if I did. If I didn't, no. I got to send you this. Oh, oh my yeah, God. You I, wanna... I, I, let me send you. Yeah, I'm going to send it to you as soon if, as we get off. If you off, want to, I'd love to see it. Oh, yeah, course, or, yeah, or yeah. is it going to play at any more festivals? I know it premiered at Genre I... Blast, which I'd love to go to someday. Yes. I know that's a so, big one. The, the main goal here was to complete the movie i'm not i wasn't so concerned with any kind of festival run to begin with because i wasn't even sure if i was going to be able to complete this thing and i i i made a promise to myself that i had to see this thing through i started it i had to finish it and so for me it was about finishing something that that really hurt that it wasn't that it was left unfinished and you know partially it was my fault and partially it was just circumstance Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was it was a battle. It was a battle to get everything together. We did it. Um, it came out. I mean, I, I made that money. I made that movie for even less money than what I made my first movie for somehow. Wow. Wow. And amazing. Ugh. It's crazy. But it exists. And yes, I will send it to you. And actually, I would love to actually hear what because you would I'd want you to watch it blind. I want to hear yeah. if you I want to know if you understand what's going on. <laughs> So uh, but, do, you, yeah. do you think you'll self-distribute in the coming 100%, months? 100%, yes. Okay, so, cool. So one of the things about making micro-budget feature-length films, I've made two now, mm-hmm. is I own them. I own the movies in their oh, entirety. Yeah. I did not crowdfund these movies. I don't nope. have to do any fulfillments or anything. 
I, I just simply own the movie, and when it's time to distribute, uh, and I have a self-distribution plan uh, for the digital stuff, I probably will just do uh, Film Hub. But at the end of the day, if someone's going to be distributing the movie and making money, it might as well be me and not yeah. giving my movie to someone else. And now it's like everybody's focused on 2B TV, which is where I think that's really my primary goal. And yeah, then to do a good. really solid physical release. And then really, cool. not to put so much emphasis, man, it's like, look, you f it's just like doing the live shows, man. You finish mm -hmm. a film, move on to the next one. So I'm actually already writing my next film. It's called My wow. Shadow. My Shadow. I'm, I'm at page 50. Oh, look at um, you. It is Halfway. going to be it is a it is going to be the most challenging film I've ever made because it's involves a lot, but it's like it's a type of movie. It's a movie where if I can pull it off, like really pull it off as the full vision that I have in my head, and I've never made a movie to this day, I've not made a movie that completely executes the vision that I initially had for it. Oh yeah, I hear but you. But if I can I think this is a movie that, like, I could sell the shutter. I really do. I really Ooh, think it's like that kind love of thing. That. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, I just, I really, I feel very strongly about this idea. And the only thing I will say about it, and I guess this is really the first time I'm publicly talking about it. Ooh, tell um, me. Give me the exclusive. I'm Gail Levis. Well, actually, <laughs> it's Frankenstein mm. meets Frankenweenie mm. meets Pet Cemetery mm. meets Little Shop of Horrors meets mm. Ed and his dead mother. If it all took place in the world of Eraserhead directed by David Lynch. Wow. Oh my God. That is, yeah. And so that's that is quite a cocktail. Absolutely. That Look is a that. cocktail, man. <laughs> that with a little bit of reanimator. I don't know if I got some reanimator. Reanimator Ooh. thrown in there too. So it's wow. uh yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy with how it's coming out too. It's really quirky, really weird. It really is the voice that I've been cultivating over these last two movies. I feel like this is a voice that I've now oh, cool. found. Yeah. That's wow. the next one. So we'll see. Oh, we'll cool, see Jeff. Good for you. Yeah. All right. I love that. I, I Anytime I hear someone is writing even 50 pages, like that's amazing. Good for you. Because I've only been focusing you, on sir. shorts. I'm going to work on a feature just kind of for fun of it, you know. The Hell yeah, it, dude. But, uh, yeah. But wow. Anything over like 20 pages, I'm like, what? You know, I'm in shorts world. It's just it's just exercising a muscle, man. You get to a point, mm -hmm. you already know what it is to write a script and you've written yep. a bunch of them. All you got to do is when you push the envelope and you just keep going and going and going. And then once you've done it, once you've gotten to that point, you see, you go, oh, that's what this is. And you'll be able to do it even easier the next time and the next yep. time and the next time. That's great. Good for you. Keep the creative Thank juices you. flowing. I'm sending will, good man. vibes your way. But you. now, Jeff, let's talk about a whole different movie. Let's Please. rewind. We're going to talk about a guilty pleasure called Leprechaun that came out 30 <laughs> years ago this month. Oh, I'm yeah. so happy you're here to talk about this because you and I, we like our horror. We like our weird stuff. But also it's just fun because I know that, you know, this movie, it's not a good movie. But I have to tell you, after rewatching it, this movie gives me such comfort maybe because mm. it's that thing that happens to us when we watch movies that we watched as a kid so sure. watching them you just immediately kind of feel like that warm blanket which is comfort, funny to say comfort, yeah it's a comfy you know blanket. about yeah like leprechaun is a comfy blanket for me you know well before i set the scene and tell you what was going on at this time 30 years Please. ago tell me jeff when did you first see leprechaun did you see do you remember how old you were do you have any memories of that first Young. time I was yeah. young and I saw it on TV and mm. I still remember, I remember the opening very well. And oh, as yeah. a young person, and this is the way it is with a lot of horror movies, even when the tone doesn't match that, but it doesn't like match what you are experiencing. Um, I would, it, it was a very serious movie to me when I <laughs> yeah. first saw it, like that opening scene is su was super serious. And then, you know, when I watched it again as an adult and I've seen it as an adult several times, you know, a bunch of times, I, I like, you know, obviously it's like, it's very schlocky. It's very totally. like, goofy, but like as a kid, you take it and it was the same thing. I remember Troll 2. Yeah. I remember like thinking Troll Two, like the <laughs> ending. You want some, Joshua? At the very end, when they're eating the mom, right. I was like, "Holy shit, this is so serious!" And it was like the most, it's just not serious at all. But, like, oh my that's god, how you? That's you what are happened. so right. I thought the same thing. And rewatching it, like I said, like it, it's that warm blanket. I remember it so well. But as mm -hmm. a kid, same thing, Jeff. Especially the beginning. The beginning, not that it's scary at all, but I can remember feeling scared as a kid because it's so dark, and now this 
this goblin-y leprechaun is now in this guy's house and, you know, at the top of the stairs after he pushes his wife down. Like, you know, right. so I am right there with you that, yeah, it seems so serious, so, you know, intense when actually it's I know it's a horror comedy, but it's pretty much a comedy, you know, like, yeah, it's it's funny because yeah, just as you get older, you realize, like, <clears throat> oh, wow, I was wrong about this. Like, I am seeing this with fresh eyes. But as a kid, it's scary. Right. So we'll get into yeah. it. We'll talk about our favorite scenes and all that good stuff in a second. The luck of the Irish is being packed and shipped to a little town in South Dakota, whose luck may have just run out. Let me set the scene for you, Jeff. Please. So this is what was going on in pop culture in the beginning of 93, 30 years ago. So you bring up Troll 2. Love it. This is kind of, it's funny because Leprechaun and its franchise is sort of what another franchise that you and I love that we were just talking about on your show, Scream would make fun of, right? The original Scream was talking about like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. all these lame, repetitive, <clears throat> bad, schlocky horror movies. This is what was out in the early 90s, horror, okay? We had Tremors. We had Child's Play 2, Gremlins 2, Troll 2, a movie called Frankenhooker, and oh, Arachnophobia. Oh, we, talked about, we talked a lot about Frankenhooker. Frankenhooker, right? It's playing uh, at the uh, Alamo. Playing at the Alamo oh. in, uh, this month. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my God. Yep. And I, I was reading that the makeup artist for this film was a makeup artist for Frankenhooker. So there you go. That's a double oh, feature right there. Gabe, right? Uh, what's his name? Gabe, uh, uh, is it Bartolos? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right? man, that dude is done, man, that dude's done a lot of movies, man. He's, yeah, Legend. oh yeah, Legend. totally. Really good stuff. So all of those movies were out in 1990. 1991 brought us Freddy's Dead, uh, mm -hmm. The Final Nightmare, a little schlocky, right? That was kind of Freddy at his oh, yeah. most schlocky. Yes. We had yes. Child's Play 3, Critters 3, Army of Darkness was then in 92. That was part of the Evil Dead franchise, which this film, rewatching a lot of the low angles and a lot of the running shots really sure. make me think of, you know, running through the woods in Evil Dead, right? And then we had Critters 4. So a lot of these schlocky horror comedies, especially, right? They were mm -hmm. very popular, not always that good. So in comes Leprechaun, okay? So on the news side, we were just talking about how Scream 6 is set in New York City, a place where Jeff lives. I used to live there. I thought this was fun, Jeff. 30 years ago this month, cigarette advertisements were banned in New York City's MTA in the subway. Really? They, starting in January 93. That was the beginning. That was, that the, was beginning the beginning of... The blocking those ads out right so there you go yeah the beginning of the end for for sigs um on the tv side i thought this was so interesting and like can you imagine if like they did that today get this so i didn't know this tv movie at all um i i kind of needed to a refresher on the true crime story of amy fisher but abc and cbs right, yeah. simultaneously broadcast their own individual movies about the amy fisher crime she killed she was having an affair with a married right, man joey she was a minor jo yep exactly she kills joey's or no she didn't kill joey's wife but she shot him in the face shot her at, shot amy fisher shot her I mean, in the shot, face shot uh, uh but the wife. wife in the face yes yeah. uh-huh so i yep. had no idea because I mean, we were pretty young. Early days of January, on the same night, ABC aired their version with Drew Barrymore, which is so oh. funny that that's where she was in her oh. career. And CBS aired their version with Alyssa Milano, which is also funny because Drew Barrymore was in Poison Ivy and Alyssa Milano was in right. Poison Ivy too. So there oh. you go. Weird. And then how funny, NBC had broadcast their own film a couple days earlier, so they beat these two. I didn't recognize any names in the NBC version, but whoa, like kind of funny how back then, obviously TV movies were all the rage. And honestly, yeah. they're kind of the rage now, just we call them streaming movies, right? So it's funny when you see like, you know, things like The Dropout and all these, you know, that the whole Adnan uh, serial podcast, Ad Adnan Syed a few years ago. Um, you know, I just, I thought it was interesting how we see this example 30 years ago of these TV movies all talking about the same thing, but there was such a rush to make your own version and how that's kind of a thing still today, you know, with different streamers doing their thing. So yep. random fun fact on the music side, Whitney Houston's, I will always love you from the bodyguard, a film I talked about not that long ago on the show. By was, Dolly Parton. Yes. Written by good old Dolly. That was number one for weeks and weeks and weeks. So that was having its moment. One of the most, one of the most uh, uh, profitable and successful mm. uh, songs ever in the history Absolutely. of songs. It, it, right? The Bodyguard soundtrack uh, is up there uh, with one of the great, uh, because of that song. 
Oh, yeah. It's amazing how many awesome singles came from that soundtrack. Totally. So she was the reigning music queen. Yep. Also a song that I forgot about, but love. Rhythm is a dancer. Oh, da, I love that, song. that was that was big in the day at 30 years ago. Popular movies. A Few Good Men. Aladdin. Disney's Aladdin. Scent of a Woman, The Bodyguard, and Forever Jurassic Young. Those were Jurassic the top Park. five. Oh, oh, right. In, uh, Jurassic Park came out later summer. in 93. Yep, mm -hmm, exactly. So we weren't there yet, but I'm sure those trailers were playing. Ooh, the Bodyguard was 93? I thought it was 91. No, The Bodyguard was 92. Uh, Thanksgiving, 92. So that was oh, still okay. popular. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep, yeah, two yeah, months yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. so those were the top five films at the box office. Most of them were all from you know the year prior because this was the first weekend-ish of the year back then then and so leprechaun you know you would think they would have released leprechaun i don't know in march closer to saint patty's day but you know we're talking about a movie that was kind of dumped in the dumping grounds you know january mm -hmm. we know was sort of like for a long time what do you think jeff because scream 5 was in january i feel like january now is no longer a dumping ground for movie releases or do you think it still is um, kind of depends. What I don't think of it as a dumping ground. What I think of it as, I think of it as a way of leveling the playing field because a lot of the things that maybe would, like, for instance, again, to bring up Scream, since we love talking about Scream so much, you look at, like, Scream 1 and Scream 2 both came out in December, December but yep. Scream 3, I think, came out in January. Fe it was early February. Early February. And yep. I don't know when Scream 4 came out, but Scream 5 came out in January. And I, yep. think, I think what that is all about is that you know christmas time really became or at least i don't know how it was in the 90s as much as it is now or at least in the last two decades where you release your big prestige oscar film people are watching oscar right big oscar films any any film that's going to do big box office business is coming out around december and yep. you are not going to pit any movies that have potential at making box office bucks against something that's just super out of its league. You know, you could sit there and talk about how, oh, this movie uh, just didn't do well at the box office. Or you could be like, um, hey, wait a minute. Why are you releasing that now? And yeah. so give, give a movie a chance to spread its legs instead of pitting it against, you know, competition where it's not going to do well. So yeah. I don't think of January as a dumping ground anymore. I think of January, January is a very strategic sort of place. Like for instance, Megan is coming out now in January yeah. mm -hmm. and they could have released Megan. They started doing a, a campaign for Megan on TikTok with everybody doing the viral dance in <laughs> October. Yeah. I thought it was going to have an October release. I'm going, well, if you're not going to release in October, but you're doing this campaign, like, my yeah. God, does that mean you're going to release it in December or November? They're like, or, or, or yeah, or November. And they're uh -huh. like, no, we're going to do it in January. Yeah, old school. Like which makes, it makes a lot of sense. And now it's been a stat. They've established it with this. Everybody knows who Megan is because of that, 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 that dance. Yep. So it's mm -hmm. like, it was actually really smart marketing, uh, marketing technique. I believe I was Blumhouse. I'm going to go see it. I'll probably go see it on uh, Saturday night. So it looks fun. It looks totally fun. Looks, I don't know if I'll go to the theater, but um, I'm, I, I mean, it looks fun. I, Hey, I love a good killer doll robot. Yeah. I mean, let's do it. Why right. Not? But yeah, oh, you're yeah. Right. You, you bring up a great point. Yeah. January. It could be a dumping ground for some bad movies or for movies like Megan, it clears the path. She's free. There's not much competition at all, especially exactly. right now. <laughs> so, Leprechaun comes out January 8th, 1993. Jeff, I'm going to throw it over to you in your own words, because some people listening might have never seen this. They're not as cool as us. In your own words, tell us, what is Leprechaun about? <laughs> Leprechaun is about, it's, it's okay, so this family is moving, I guess, from the big city or whatever, from what I remember, mm -hmm. uh, which features a Jennifer Aniston in her very first feature film as a wow. star, and, you know, the funny thing, too, is, like, she was super embarrassed by right. this film and sort of, like, downplayed it for a long time. And it's so funny because literally next year she lands Friends and then yeah. blows up and became not just Jennifer Aniston, but also Jennifer Aniston's hair, which was, like, the biggest the thing Rachel, in the world. Rachel, yes. Yeah, especially, uh -huh. like, season – Rachel hair from season, like, two, two three? to yeah. four, two uh -huh. to three. Every That was, like, the hottest hair, dude. Everybody wanted that hair. Every, every guy – <laughs> was in love with Rachel. 
Yeah. You know, every girl wanted to be Rachel. You know, it was a that was a big thing. I I remember that, man. I remember that well. Even young, young I remember that. Oh yeah. Um and so and then she did something to her hair in season four where it was like her hair just like she went straight. It was very straight, straight and long yeah. for a while, right? Yep. But you know what's kind of funny is that the Rachel is now really become the Karen, which is kind of sad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's you're so, so sad. Right. It's like mom hair, but like, uh, man, in the '90s, that was hot, dude. That yeah, was oh, a yeah. hot fucking style. Man. It had a bounce, baby. Dude, yeah, but you're so oh, right. Man. Yeah, and and let me tell you something. Like that was like like that was the look. That was yeah. look. It's so funny how now it's like that's that's the Karen look. That's the that's hair. the look you run away from. That's yeah. the look that you run away from. That's the <laughs> I want to talk to a manager. Look. Yes. In any case, <laughs> you have a young Jennifer Aniston. I believe that's also a pretty nose job, Jennifer Aniston. She yep, looks like I she's think a you're little right. bit more beaky. Which I listen. I don't care. It does not, I got a beak too. It's beaky. not, you know, we don't have to, we're not, not to, yeah. not to oh, no, no shade. spatial features. Yeah, no shade. Yeah. Um, um, but it's like, I'm just saying, it's like a very fresh Jennifer Aniston. She's probably done yeah. a little bit of TV yep, and her and her dad, I think it is, and her little brother, they, they moved to this house and the house used to belong to this old dude who we see at the opening mm-hmm. and he has, uh, his wife has died and he was quarreling with a leprechaun because he stole the leprechaun's. Uh, gold, a hundred pieces of gold. And the thing yes. is, we don't really like, I, maybe they mention it. I don't know. I guess I, this would have benefited me for a revisit as to, as to uh, how he found the leprechaun or why he found the leprechaun or whatever, but he seals away the leprechaun for some, some spell yeah. after his <laughs> wife is killed. And, uh-huh. um, and I'll tell you, the leprechaun looks like a serious tour de force when he's, when the old man's dealing with him and you're like, Oh my God. Oh, really yeah. scary. I think he goes in a barrel, right? Isn't yes, he, he goes in this yeah. random big crate in the basement. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I, and I he's there for need, 10 years. It's uh, 10 years. Okay. Yeah. And I also, we need to take a moment. You, you, you've done a very good job painting the picture, but you yeah. need to also highlight that this is the dawn of the Trimark age. Now, Absolutely, Jeff. Tell in us. The 90s, yes. In the 90s, you had, this is sort of like the continuation of what the canon films and Vestron video was mm. in the eighties. I think Vestron video is eighties, not really nineties as much. Vestron video was, I don't know, mm. something like something. Yeah, Vestron Vestron video was like late eighties. Yeah, that gave way to labels. You had a bunch of them, but the main one, the one that I remember, was motherfucking Trimark, which yeah. was just like they they did a lot of straight to video stuff. They did yeah. a lot of low budget horror stuff. Here's some stuff. That we got from Trimark. Oh yeah, tell me. Um, we got Cyborg Two with Angelina Jolie, which is a Ooh. sequel to Cyborg with with uh, with uh, Van Dam. And oh, if you've never seen Cyborg Two. It is just with Jack Palance and Ooh. and Angelina Jolie. You know, she gets fully naked and she is just like oh, it's does super she really hot twenty wow. something. Yeah, she's super hot in it, and she's just like she's gorgeous, man. Um, and she's a robot. And it also has that dude. God, what's his, what's his name? Um, he's in a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, so you had Cyborg Two. You had uh, what's it called? Not not Free Jack. It was Free Fall, Freeway. It was like oh. a weird thriller with Eric oh. Roberts. Oh, okay. I thought for a second. I thought it was was it Free? Not Free Jack. With... That's with that's with yeah. Mick Jagger. Now it's gonna bother me. Now I gotta look this up. I, I know. I'm looking be, it up too. Uh, you also had the Leprechaun movies. You had Leprechaun. Mm-hmm. I believe one, two, three, and four came Eesh. out on Trimark and then yep. when Leprechaun 5 uh, in the hood and Leprechaun back to the hood <laughs> were not on Trimark I believe that might have switched over to Lion Gate because Lion oh, Gate absorbed yeah. uh-huh. Trimark but you also had Return of Living Dead Part 3 yeah. you had Peter Jackson's Dead Alive which I still you need had, to see. I haven't seen. You never. Oh my god, dude! It's like never available. I. It's like never streaming anywhere. Okay, I gotta find we're it gonna somewhere. Do. You're gonna watch Dead Alive. Oh, yeah, of course it's not available because this motherfucker's out of print. When, yeah. When when that becomes available, you are gonna come on my show and we're gonna oh. talk Dead Alive. Uh, and I, the reason why I love Trimark so much is because it just it really it really captures that. It really captures the '90s and like this whole like I don't know. It captures the video store for me and the '90s and just like simpler times and just like my my youth. And yeah. so I love. There's nothing like putting in Return of Living Dead three the tape and like mm-hmm. watching the trailers. And of course, one of the trailers is Leprechaun two and Dead Alive oh, and uh, just a bunch of a bunch of trailers to to stuff that um, that I just love. I don't know. It's just like this. Perfect little time capsule. And so yep. Leprechaun is a part of that. And yeah. so 
to get back to the the plot, basically a <laughs> leprechaun, uh, a, ba- a leprechaun is basically trying to track down his hundred pieces of gold. He gets released from the barrel. New yeah. people moved in. Uh, the dude from Teen Wolf plays this like simpleton. It's the only yeah. way to describe it, right? Yeah, uh, he, Mark they, something. I forget his name. Uh, uh, Mark, I forget his name as well, but it, I'll look it up. It's not. He's a also hard in last Pee Wee Herman. Uh, Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure. Yes. And it's interesting, Jeff, did you know, because there are so many sequels, and I, I've only seen the first couple. I never made it to Leprechaun in Space, and after that- Oh, there... you have to see Leprechaun in Space. Yeah? Oh, yeah. God. I remember, oh, yeah. I remember two is in <laughs> Vegas, and three, three is- Three is in Vegas. Three is oh, in three Vegas. is in Vegas. Two, uh, okay. two is weird. Two is not in Vegas. As a matter of fact, it's sort of like, it, it starts off like a long time ago. It's like kind of like a fairy oh, tale thing. Yes. A okay, bit. that that rings a bell. Yes. His name's Mark Holton. Mark and Holton. What I is bring he up in? he uh, so yeah you're right he's in Teen Wolf one and two yeah. he yeah. uh the year prior to this another film I talked about in this podcast he has a very small little role in A League of Their Own that was one of his bigger things right you know he's still working because he's in the latest Leprechaun reboot as his character Ozzy you know, I haven't seen that back. one yet but now yeah. that you said that now I have to rewatch it now I have to go and watch it I mean I mean I'm curious but apparently I mean it's on IMDb they list it as a comedy fantasy horror but I have heard that it is pretty serious horror and not as comedic and it like really loses it was its, made by like you know. WWF like I know movie yeah, studio I just it's, was, it's, didn't seem interesting to me right like, no not, Warwick Davis yeah exactly you can't I, have a leprechaun movie without Warwick Davis who was amen. in he was in all six Leprechaun yeah. movies over a course of 10 years from from 1993 to about 2003. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, you know, uh, I know he's had like mixed feelings about like he loves the Leprechaun series, but he also kind of like hates it at the same time. Yeah, I saw that, too. What do you think of that? Well, I think it. I, I think that it's weird. You know, it's a weird thing. Um, I, I'll tell you from the Peter Dinklage POV yep. and uh, Peter Dinklage is a little person actor who is. um you know, very sensitive about the stereotyping and pigeonholing of little people in ver- these various sort of stereotypical roles that go mm-hmm. to little people, like elves and, you know, like all these sort of mystical creatures and things. And, you know, yeah. that usually little people are portrayed. You don't have a lot of little people who are just like, like just happen to be a little person. Like there's very few movies where it's like, oh, like, and that's why the station agent is actually a really great film starring Mm. Peter Dinklage. Yep. The point being is that there is a big stigma and sensitivity and there's like two sides to it. And the other side Mm. of it is, Hey, we're actors and this is how we eat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Warwick Davis especially has, has been obviously Willow and he was, you know, Ewoks and Star Trek and all that. So he, that's interesting. He's the opposite. Willow was a very, and that's what's, well, that's what's interesting too, is that, I feel like Willow is like a really sort of like positive sort of depiction of little people in, in cinematic roles as opposed to, Hey, look, it's a, it's a, what's it called from the, from the wizard of Oz, the, the lollipop gang, the, or the, yeah, uh-huh. the munchkins, munchkins, the munchkins. Are like, hey, yep. you know, like, like whatever, whatever the thing is, or, you know, this idea of a little person playing a leprechaun, you know, on, on some level, it's like, Hey, like what the, what the F man, like you're making us, you know, what are you doing? But then on the other hand, it's like, hey, I'm an actor. This is my profession. Here's a role. Yeah. Here's a role that, that's kept me eating for the last 10 years. You know, I've been doing other stuff, but like that's, you know, it's good to get a movie every, you know, uh, you know, seven movies in 10 years doing oh, this yeah. thing. Uh-huh. It's busy. Thanks so much for watching. Next week will be part two of this discussion. And in the meantime, please follow Release Date Rewind on Instagram. I'm-